In today's episode, we are going to cover four things you need to do to grow your business in 2024. And I'm also going to include a portion of me just ranting on why it's not just about working harder. So there's a lot of great information in this episode. And I wanna give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Jobber. So Jobber is a software we, we use in our business on a daily basis. And I've been using Jobber now for almost, almost five years now. And we use it every day in our business to either book out customers in our schedule, whether it's sending automated appointment reminders, whether it's employees clocking in or out, keeping track of customers' information. So we run everything through Jobber. And especially going into the spring rush, which like March, April, May, June, when things get really crazy and the work just kind of doubles and triples, you need a good software to streamline your business. If you wanna get a free 14-day trial plus a special discount, click the link down in the show notes or if you're watching this on YouTube, in the description box and give it a try. And welcome back to a new episode. Glad to have you here. Today, we, we are gonna cover four things you need to do in your business to grow in 2024. I have a little list here of things I'm going to cover. Um, but at first, before we get into the four things, I did see a, uh, I forgot what post it was, um, but you know, there's always the, the people that wanna talk about like how hard they work and how they won't be outworked and you know, things of that nature. And uh, when I saw that, I was like, man, like, I'd say, if, if you want to outwork me, like, by all means, go and outwork me because I'm not, you know, there is a difference between the input that you put in, right, as far as the activities, the work, the task, the time, and then the output, meaning the results, right, the things you actually generate from the input. So, um, you know, in business, in life, whether it is growing a business, whether it is learning a new skill, a new hobby, whatever it is, whatever you want to improve on, the input is nowhere near as important as the output, okay? Um, so don't, it, it, like, if someone were to come to me and be like, hey, bro, like, you know, you know, it, you know, I'll, I'll outwork you as a detailer, bro. Like, I, I'm out there polishing paint or I'll stay up to 2 a.m. To, to finish a car. I'd be like, bro, by all means, go do that because I, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't want to have the mentality where, like, I, I'm i not forced to work, but, like, the, the only way I see to be successful is to just keep on working more. That That's not, you know, there's times where it calls for it because maybe your, your schedule super, you know, maxed out, you're balancing a full-time job, plus you're, um, you're just starting your business and you're trying to, you know, balance or at least try to capitalize on trying to book out your schedule. So, so there's a time and place for it. But, you know, like, am I worried about, you know, being the hardest worker or like someone outworking me? Like, no, not at all. Because like, that's just not something that is a metric of any kind to me. Um, and uh, I uh, forgot what book it was, but like, don't work harder, work differently. I forgot what book it was. But basically, it's like, if you think that, the, you know, for instance, I, I started, um, I, I talked about it on the podcast on a few YouTube videos where I started I started a new um, website. I was checking that the, the thing was recording. I started a new website, a kind of like a, a, a side project or more like a case study on ranking a website on a first page of Google. Now this one is specifically to generate leads for our business as well. Now I started the website, uh, I mean, yeah, like 75 days ago now. And since then, uh, if you look at the analytics in Google Search Console, all the numbers keep on going up, right? The, the, the impressions keep on going up. The average position keeps on going up. The clicks to the website keep on going up. Um, and it's only been 75 days. And since then I've, we've, I've generated four leads from that website. Right. And, and this isn't connected to our, our, our other website, our, like, like our, our main detailing website. Like this is like a separate thing. I don't mention anything about our other website or, or like that we run another business. Like this is a standalone, you know, no reviews on the Google business profile. Like it's just, it's, it's a, it's a complete separate website. And I booked in a, uh, a $325 um, roof wrap yesterday. Um, it's 430 because the material is $105, but the labor itself is just 325. My point being is that it's been 75 days. Um, I already generated, I generated four leads from there, one of them booked, and it's only been 75 days. In four months, in six months, it's gonna have totally different results. So, and my point being is like, I did everything on the computer. I created the website. I optimized the website with SEO, search engine optimization, and it's working for me. 
it is slowly going up the ranks. It's slowly generating clicks and it's slowly generating leads. And we booked, you know, we booked a customer from there. Did, you know, did, did I hustle and like, you know, work 12 hours to get that done? Or did I go and drive to every dealership around here and introduce myself and talk to my, and talk to, you know, like, am I out there, you know, would I claim, oh bro, like I'm, I'm outworking you. No, not a lot, not at all. It's like, if you know the levers to pull or push and pull in order to generate the results that you want, like you just do that, right? So so if someone says like, oh, I'll outwork anyone. Oh, I'm working so hard. Oh, bro, I'm grinding. It's like, that does not matter, right? Input is not as important as output. Now, don't get me wrong. Again, like you have to work hard. Like there's no, you know, there's no doubt about that, right? You have to work hard. You have to be disciplined. You have to be committed. You have to be punctual. You have to be like, that, that's, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying you don't work hard and you don't have a plan. Not that part. What I'm saying is when you, when they kind of talk over and say like, you know, when they try to glamorize, um, working hard for the sake of working hard, you know? Um, so it's like, that's not something that should be of importance to you. That's not a metric of success. That's not a metric of progress, right? Um, you have to have the, 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 the right metric to say, okay, what is actually improving my business or what's actually making me progress in this thing that I want to do? Because again, it, it's, it's not just business. It's not, it, it could be anything, right? Like right now I'm learning how to, um, um, sim racing, right? I have a, a sim rig in my, in my office and you know, I have very limited time on the amount of hours or the amount of time I could spend on the sim, right? I'd like to spend, you know, twice as much, three times as much time on the sim, you know, it's a video game or it's a sim, right? Um, and iRacing, uh, but it's like, I, I don't have endless time to just sit there and like spend an hour at, at a time, right? I have 15 minutes here, 25 minutes there, 10 minutes here, 15 minutes there. So when I'm on the sim and I'm trying to, you know, learn the race craft and learn how to properly race and how to actually, you know, do all this stuff. It's like, I'm very intentional with what I'm doing, right? I'm not just going there and going in, you know, lap after lap and trying to be some cool guy and trying to, you know, take these corners. That's like, I'm, I'm learning the fundamentals. I'm, I'm, I'm only learning and applying what I can do in the given time. And if I'm making just a 0.01% improvement on breaking, on trail breaking, on entering or exiting a corner, on overtaking, on you know, whatever, like whatever it is, if I'm just making a 0.01 improvement, that's good enough for me. Right. So it, like, it, it's not, I'm like, oh yeah, bro. Like I, I'm there and like, I'm learning this and I'm learning that. It's like, you only need to focus on a few things, whatever those few things are in the given time that you have. And you try to make as much improvement again, whether it's, you know, you have, you have 15 minutes or 45 minutes, you make as much improvement as you can, but it, it's not just about saying, oh bro, like I, I'm there, you know, I'm four hours on the sim every day. It's like, does that mean you're getting better? Does that, or, or is ego getting in your way and, and you're just trying to do hot laps and you're not actually learning how to break properly or take a corner properly or overtake properly. Like you're just there trying to send it every single time. It's like, well, what do you learn from that, right? Someone that's on there for an hour and a half, but not being intentional, not being uh, strategic about what they're learning, what they're improving, is not gonna say, make the same improvement as someone that has you know, 15 minutes on the sim, but they're like, okay, like I'm, t today I'm just going to focus on breaking. That's it. Just breaking on and whatever, whatever. Right. And that applies to literally every, anything, right? If, if, if someone is trying to work, you know, if someone's working out in the gym, um, and someone's working out in the gym and they're like, bro, I I'm in there for two hours, you know, like I I'm, I'm, I'm hitting a lot of sets. I'm going heavy weight, like, like, you know, and they're just, bro, I'm in there for two hours. It's like you being in there for two hours is no different than someone being in there for 40 minutes but that person that, that's in it for 40 minutes has a proper plan, knows how to actually, um, you know, have time under tension, that knows how to do a proper exercise, that knows how to, you know, actually program their their their, their workouts to make sure that they're getting optimal, uh, optimal results in the 40 minutes that they're working out versus someone that works out for two hours, you know? Um, so this is literally applicable to every asset, uh, um, facet of your life, your business. Working more does not equate or correlate to any degree you produce more like at all, right? You, like if you want to get more customers, if you want to go and whatever, whatever, like just because you work more does not mean you get any more out of it, right? Don't just focus on the input of, oh, I work more. Oh, look, I'm working more hours. Oh, look, I spend so much time on this project, on this task. But then what's the output of that? Well, did, did you actually make progress? Did you make improvement? Did you actually get more customers? Did you actually decrease the time you're working on the customer's vehicle? Did you actually get more views? Did you act like, so you have to focus on the output a lot more than the input. And it's not just about working harder, right? I forgot what book it was, but say like, don't work harder, work differently, right? Like there's other ways to do things. And if you're just stuck on this one way to do things, well, I mean, you know, how are you ever going to improve or, or learn or adapt or evolve or change or anything if you're only stuck in this one way? 
So I don't care about working harder. I don't care about being the hardest worker in the room. That's a vanity metric. Um, it, you know, you can glamorize it on social media, but aside from that, like, <laughs> like if someone says like, oh, we're like, you know, I'll outwork you, I'm, I'm up to 2 a.m. And I've seen detailers post this as well. I'm like, bro, I don't care about that, dude. I wanna go home and be with my family. I wanna spend 30 minutes on the sim. Like, please, you go out there and be polishing paint, bro. Like, I'll, I'll figure out another way to get everything done and continue to grow the business and to con continue to, to push the business forward. And, you know, working to 2 a.m. on a car is, is not that way, you know? Um, so again, it's not just about working harder. It's not about inputs. It's about working differently, working smarter, and having greater outputs. Okay, so now let's go into the four things about growing your detailing business. All right, so number one here is you have to, have to, have to market. And look, I'm saying this for 2024. This was applicable 2023. This was applicable 2019. This is gonna be applicable in 2026, right? Because the fundamentals don't really change. Um, as far as what needs to get done, now how it gets done, or, or what avenues uh, that you have to achieve those results, that's different, but the fundamentals always say the same. So number one is market your services to generate more leads. This one here will never change, right? Like it doesn't matter if you're making 500 a month and you wanna to go to $2,500 a month, or if you're at 20,000 a month and you wanna make 45,000 a month, right? You need to generate more leads. Yes, you have your existing customer base, you'll get referrals, they'll, your current customers will be repeat customers and you know they'll bring you more vehicles, like for sure. But that still doesn't change the fact of if you generate more leads, more high quality leads on a daily basis, your business will continue to grow, right? Because you always wanna have your pipeline, right? You always wanna have a strong, healthy amount of, or of leads that are waiting to book with you. Because when you're in that position, that you have enough leads that like people are waiting to book in into your calendar, you don't get caught up in customers that either are haggling you on price or giving you a hard time or asking for demands that you just don't wanna do. Like that goes out the window because you have this big other uh, pool of, of, of high quality leads that wanna book with you, that wanna pay your premium rights, that aren't gonna give you any trouble, that are, are easy to work with, that are great to work with, that become great clients. Like when you are in that position to say, oh, like, man, that dude's kind of asking for, for this and that. It's like, man, it's just, it sounds so complicated. If you're not in the right position in business, you'd be like, yeah, bro, but we're kind of slow and we need the we need the the, the money and oh, okay, just just book it in. Oh, well, you know, he's, you know, he can only do it for for 400 and you're charging 650. It's like, okay, well, let's just do it. You're in that position. You're in the desperation, right? You just, you can only take what what, what comes your way and, and that's it. Whereas if you're in the in the position where you have a healthy lead flow, you have a pool of high quality leads. And it's like, bro, we have five other customers that are waiting to book with us. Like, let's forget that one. Like, it's okay. That's that's not the type of customer you want. Let's go book in another one. Like, that's how, that's, that, I didn't mean to do that, my bad. Uh, that is uh, a clear sign of a healthy business and a not healthy business or a business that's struggling to survive to one that is thriving, right? Like those are the differences in your business. Again, wh whether it's just you on your own, when, you, when you're first getting started, when you have a team of two, three, four, like those things are the same. Like you wanna be able to work with your most ideal customers. You wanna be able to work with the customers that actually appreciate your services, appreciate what you do. They appreciate their own vehicle, right? Which is why they're getting it detailed. Like those are the customers you wanna work with. And I'm not coming in a position to say, oh, well, the only customers that want that are, are for paint correction, ceramic coating. Like that's not what I'm saying. Rel you know, based on what kind of services you wanna offer and the kind of business you wanna run, that's gonna be something you have to be contextual with yourself. Meaning if you, know, if you wanna offer just maintenance washes or maintenance details, call it, uh, which is like an exterior wash and a quick interior detail, whatever that means to you, then you'll have your own set of customers, your, your own set of ideal customers, right? So, so you know, it, your ideal customer is someone that wants to spend you know, $95 on a maintenance program bi-weekly, right? And someone else's ideal customer is someone that spends, you know, $900, $1,400 on a correction and coding. Um, so like, you know, I'm not saying there's one is better than the other. It's like, whatever your ideal customer is, whatever your target goal is, like you have to adapt and, 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 and figure out what's your best customer and then follow that game plan and, and generate those leads and generate those customers, right? So it's not saying, oh, well, the only good customers are the ones that pay the most. It's like, not necessarily, it just depends on the kind of business that you want, right? Like, I mean, look at all the local, you know, the car wash down the street, right? I mean, you know, 
most of those customers that go over there would never pay for our services, right? Because it's just like, we're probably quadruple, quintuple, quintuple the price of what they charge over there, right? And no, we're not wrong. They're not wrong. They're, you know, they're not cheap. It's just like, they just, that's, there's different customers for different businesses. That, that, that's as simple as it gets. Um, so none of this happens. You don't get to have these options or are able to change your prices or, 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 or buy new equipment or hire a team or uh, expand your business or, or do like, you're not able to do anything in your business if you do not have high quality leads coming into your business on a daily basis. That just, it's just not gonna happen. Like there is no way to do it. Um, and going back to my earlier point of like, look, I, how many of you that are, are listening to this have a website for six months, a year, two years, and it hasn't produced any results, right? And then I have a website brand new from scratch, 75 days, and already booked a $300 vinyl wrap roof job. And it's only 75 days in. Not here to, to, to gloat or to, to, you know, say how good I am, but that is a difference in, in what I'm saying of like input versus output, right? Like if you wanna grow your business in 2024, if you wanna do whatever, whatever, if you wanna grow, if you wanna go and hire a team, but it's like, you need to know what leverage to push and pull and a big part of all of this is your marketing, right? Search engine optimization, that's SEO. That's what I've done over the last like nine years now. Um, you have Google ads, which we also run as well. You have Facebook ads, Instagram ads. Um, you know, I, I don't really count referrals and word of mouth just because that's a byproduct of having customers already, right? Like if, if, if you're just getting started and I tell you, hey, double your referrals, it's like, well, I barely have any customers to begin with. So how do, how do I get more referrals when I, I don't have customers to start with, you know? So that, that's why I don't really count those. Referrals and word of mouth are great once your business is actually going and you're actually having consistent customers to, you know, because that's how you're able to get referrals and word of mouth, not not just like, oh, well, I wanna get more word of mouth customers. It's like, well, you don't have any customers right now. So how, how do the word of mouth customers begin? Um, so 2024, focus on marketing. That's never gonna stop. Uh, number two is communicate with your customers. Now this one sounds very, very basic. Um, and like I said, most of what you need to do to grow your business are the fundamentals. Uh, number two is communicate with your customers. So that means like basic, what, what business have you gone to in recent times to where you were like, oh man, that was such a great business, right? Like that you were like, oh man, I had such a great time working with them, right? What was it about it, right? What was it that they had the best, you know, call it like a restaurant. Was it that they had the best food? Possibly. Was it that they had the best staff? Possibly. Was it had the best the best ambiance, ambiance in the in the restaurant? Possibly, right? So like you look at what businesses you like to do business with, right? As a customer, and you see and, and just kind of audit audit that experience and see what was it? Was the staff super friendly, right? So a big part of any any customer, any person having a good time and a good experience with a business is a communication, right? When you when they call you, do you pick up on the first few rings? If you missed a call, do you call them back immediately? Um, if you say you're gonna call them back at 1 p.m., do you call them back at 1 p.m.? Do you keep them in the loop when you're working on their vehicle? And if you told them the, the job's gonna be done at 1 p.m., but you know it got pushed back because whatever, whatever, and you're gonna be done by 2.30 p.m., do you let them know ahead of time so they can plan around that, right? Are you there at 9 a.m. when you say you're gonna get there at 9 a.m.? Um, you know, like that is communication. When they call you are, you, are you actually answering other questions? Are you making sure that, that, that they have all the information that they need to either, you know, make the right decision or to whatever, whatever, like, are you giving them what they need to feel confident in their decisions and are confident in you as the business, as a detailer, as a professional, to say, man, this person really cares about what I do and, and what I'm and what I want. And, you know, like this is the person that we need to we need to hire to to do the job for us. So commute, you know, communicating with your customers, it's in, in every way, right? When they first call you and it's the first very conversation that you have with them, how do you communicate with them, right? Are you actually in a, in a, in a positive, upbeat uh, uh, tone? Are you actually interested in what they have to say? Are you actually asking questions? Are you, you know, giving them the actual information? Um, you know, like people can hear your voice, people can hear your tone over the phone, right? So if you answer the phone saying, you know, um, hey, Oscar, how can I help you, right? doesn't sound very welcoming versus like, hey, this is Oscar with Zebra Detailing. Uh, how can I help you today, right? Two completely different tones and it like it, it gives a different vibe to the customer. Um, so like any form of communication to any degree is what I'm referring to with this one, with how you communicate, right? 
when you when when you book in the the appointment, do you send them an appointment confirmation? Do they get a, a appointment reminder two days before the before the the detail? Right? Do they get the on my way text when you're driving to them? Right? Like like it's not you don't just book them in, and then the next time they hear from you is when you're there. Right? Depending you know maybe depending on on you know the the time difference between when you book them into the actual appointment. Um, but that's what I'm saying. Like this is very fundamental, it's very basic, but like so many, not just detailers, so many businesses get this wrong. Like so, so, so many businesses. Um, so communicate with your customers. Okay, so number three is create the best customer experience. Now this one goes um, hand in hand with the previous one of communication because the experience is how, do you, how does a customer feel from the first time you talk to them to when you're, you know, if you're mobile detailer, to when you're driving off the driveway, right? Like from the first initial contact to when they're paying for the service and you're driving away, was it the best experience this customer has ever had with a business? And that's the way you should think about it, right? What can I do in my business? How, you know, what what standard standard operating procedures, what things can I do in my business to where this customer has some of the, you know, has the best experience that they've ever had with a business. And that's a tough question to ask, right? Because I mean, how many of us are, are so focused on the detailing part of things, right? Of being the best detailer and having the tools and products and you do the research and you look at the, you know, you look at the chemicals and the polishers and the pads and the towels and, you know, you do all this detailing stuff, but then what do you do to make sure that the customer is having the best experience possible, right? Are, you know, have you read books or listened to audiobooks or watched YouTube videos on, 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 you know, hospitality for restaurants, for hotels, have, you know, like there's, there's so many, like there's so much you can do. And there's so many things like restaurants do or, or hotels to like facilitate a, you know, fantastic customer experience. Um, and again, like there's some examples, some businesses that like go far beyond what others can do just because they have the resources, they have the money. So there's there's definitely extreme examples. But even even so, like, again, your competition are other local detailers. So you don't need to go and have, I don't know, some crazy extreme thing. But it's like, it's just getting the fundamentals right, right? Uh, same, like I said, that's why it goes hand in hand with the previous one, like picking up the phone quickly, calling back, sharing the information, looking professional, actually being happy when, when you see them in person, um, you know, always having a smile on your face. Like, you know, one thing I always did is as soon as, as I would get to the customer's job site, I would always have a smile and I would never have my hands in my pockets. Like that's the thing that I never did because it's like, I don't know where this customer is looking at me from, right? Because you're, you're driving to the home location. So, you know, you don't know if they're peeping through a window, like trying to say, Hey, is that, is that him? You know, is that him? Um, so it's like, as soon as I'd get there, I'd always have a smile on. Doesn't matter what I was doing. Doesn't matter if I was just standing outside my van because someone's looking at me, right? And I don't want them to see like, oh, that dude looks kind of mad or that dude looks kind of, he, do, he doesn't look like he wants to be there, right? So it's always a smile on my face. And then hand, the hands out the pocket thing, like, it, you know, it, it just, if you have your hands in your pocket, it just seems like you don't really care. Like it, it seems like you're, like, you're, like you're slow. Like you're just kind of like, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of here to work, right? Just hands out the pocket. It just, you know, you're here, I'm ready to work. Let's go. Like, you know, ready to check a hand and, and you know, get working on this car. So uh, even to this day, I tell like Lex and Angel, like, hey, don't put, your, don't put your hands in your pocket because it just, it seems like you don't like, you don't care. You just, you know, have your hands out. Just, you know, ready to, ready to move. Um, but things like that, right? Like as soon, like as soon as I, touch, I, I get to the, to the customer's job site, um, like I'm smiling, right? I don't know where they're at. You know, I text them that I'm here. So I'm just like, just waiting, you know, like it's a small little thing, right? And But it's like the second they see me, I want to portray like, oh, this dude's ready to work. Oh, this dude wants to be here. Oh man, this guy's ready to work. Um, You know, so 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 when you go up to them and, and, and you shake their hand, you greet them, you know, do you just, hey, can I get the keys? Or hey, you know, how's it going? You talk a little bit. Oh, let me go over the the, the details again. Um, to make sure that we're on the same page. So we're going to do the interior cleaning for, you know, 300 and the exterior for, you know, 200, making up numbers. Um, so the interior, we're going to do this, 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 this. And then, you know, we talked about this over the phone. So I just want to make sure like, this is the spot that you, whatever, whatever. And on the exterior, okay, let me go see. Oh, look. And you're like, you are in control of the situation and you're communicating with the customer and you're showing them. And then, you know, all the time, oh, okay, so this guy really knows what he's doing. Like, man, the last detailer that I had, that dude just like watched my car ride and talked to him and he just left. Like this guy's, you know, 
this guy's really different, right? And and then in the back of their head, they're like, oh, well, that's why he charges so much because like, look how much he cares and look how much he's doing. And man, like, like I've never had a detailer like this. That's the difference. That is a customer experience. So like, how does a customer feel from start to finish when they do business with you, right? At every contact point, at every whatever, it's like, are they saying, wow, man, this this detailer really knows his stuff. Oh man, I'm so glad I, I found this guy. Man, this is the best detailer I've ever hired. Man, this is the best business I've ever done work with, right? Like that's the kind of emotional response of, of experience that you wanna give someone. That way, when it comes to asking for a review, like getting reviews, getting a five-star review is not enough anymore, right? Like just getting a five-star review is not enough. It's gonna look spammy. What you want now are five-star five star raving reviews, meaning when someone leaves a review, they're like, oh my, this guy, Oscar, when I first contacted him, when I first uh, uh, called them, to the last time I talked to him, he was so punctual and communicative. I've never had a detailer like this. Man, like I was worried that I wasn't gonna be able to get those stains out of my seat, but him and his team were able to, you know, work their magic and oh, it looks so good, man. If anyone, like that's the kind of reviews you want and you only get those, not just by producing the best results, which again, is like a baseline, right? Baseline, but on top of that, you also deliver the best experience and then they're just, they're, they're so happy because, I mean, most businesses that they probably do, that they that they work with, right, that they hire, that they pay, are probably bad experiences, are, are probably not, you know, held to a high st standard. So when you come along and, you know, you're just, you know, firing on all cylinders, they're like, man, like, I wish every business was like this, right? So that's the kind of experience, emotion that you wanna curate for your customers. Um, and number four here is delivering the best results. Now, um, this one is last because it's like the baseline, right? Like if, 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 if I'm talking to a detailer about their business and what they're doing and, and how they're growing, right? And, and whether they're struggling or not, or whatever the next goal is. And they're like, yeah. And, and you know, I want to, you know, I, I try to do the best results. So, you know, I've, I've been trained and I practice and whatever, whatever. I'm like, bro, like, Growing a business, being a detailer, right? You delivering the best results should not is, is not a feature. It's not like a uh, it's not a um now customer facing, yes, don't get me wrong, but I'm talking like detailer to detailer, right? You offering the best results is a non-factor to me. Because like that's the baseline. Like if your thing, if your main selling point for your business is we deliver the best results, it's like, well, guess what? Every other detailer says the same thing, right? Which is why it's like, yeah, bro, like you delivering the best results, it's like the bare minimum you should be doing. Right now, what those best results are, yes, it, it's it's relative to your services, your business, your skills, your experience, right? So like, you know, it, again, if, if your business is maintenance washes, right? Well, your best result is a proper wash and an interior cleaning. And, you know, does that mean it's, you know, like you have your own standard of what that is, right? Because every business is gonna be different. But like, if you're doing maintenance washes, then it's like, yeah, your your best service, your best per result is like, it's a wash, right? To where someone's like, yeah, your best result is a correction and coding, right? So it's like, you in your business, as based on you as a detailer, will produce the best results. Now, many detailers are at, are at fault of this, myself included, of like, but you also have to be charging the proper amounts, right? So like, if you wanna go and do a two-step correction and a ceramic coating, right? You can only do that if the customer can afford those services, and that's it. When you're by yourself as a solo detailer, it's a lot easier to do a lot more, even if you're not getting paid for it, because it's just you, especially if you're just working at it like your home garage or your mobile, there's not many expenses, right? Maybe your car note and car insurance uh, um, and you know maybe just the tools and such, but you don't have big overhead. You don't have pay payroll. You don't have you know paying $1,500 a month for a shop rent. Like, so the expense is literally just your time. So when you're in that situation, you are, you're more likely to do a lot more without really getting paid for it, but you're okay with it because it's just you and you're still making money. Now, if you are in, if, if in the future you wanna grow your business and hire someone or get a shop or whatever, whatever, right? That can no longer happen because now it's not just your time, it's your employee's time. And guess what? That employee is on payroll with you, right? And you have to pay him for all that time. And if the customer is not paying for that level of service, but you have your employee doing that amount of work, 
then that money is coming straight out of your pocket because the customer is not covering that. You're covering that because the customer is not paying for that level of service. So doing the best work is also constrained to the level of, well, the budget that the customer has and what they want, right? Like some customers, no matter what you say, how you say it, how you present it, they don't want a correction coating. They don't care about a correction coating. What they want is a wash and wax, right? And it's like, if that's what they want, then you do the best service that you can within what they're paying for. Pretty simple, right? Um, like you, you, you can't, and I mean, and look at literally any business, right? Like if, if we're in construction and you're building a house, it's like, oh man, but they want another room, but they can't afford it. So you know what? I'll go buy the raw material. I'll go buy the wood. I'll go buy that. I'll go get the, the workers and I'll pay out of my pocket to build this other room. It's like, no, that'd be so dumb, right? Like, because there's, there's hard expenses to that, right? Like there's actual hard costs associated to building that extra room or whatever it is. Um, and it's like, you know, in, in so many other businesses, it's not looked that way, but here as detailers, because, you know, we're passionate and, you know, you want to get the shiny paint. It's like, oh, well, I could polish the paint though. Um, and don't like, again, like I, we're at fault at it as well. Like it's like, oh, well, man, it, it looked really good if we just do like a quick, like, you know, uh, cut phase and, or a cutting step and then polish it up. So again, we're, we're all at fault at it, but it's like, if you want to deliver the best results, get customers to pay you for that level of service, right? If you want to do a two-step correction and coding, get a customer to pay you a correction and coding, right? If you want to do, uh, you know, whatever level of service you want to do, make sure that they're paying for that level of service, which goes back to all my top three points here of marketing, communication, and experience. Because if you want the customer to pay for an $800 detail, a $1,600 detail, a $4,000 detail, an $8,000 detail, you're not going to get any of that if you're not marketing your services, you're not communicating properly with your customer, or if you're not creating a great customer experience, right? So you can't say, oh, well, I delivered the best results. And it's like, yeah, without making any money, being frustrated the whole time because of the customer. But yeah, you get to post a photo on social media saying, oh, look at this before and after, you know? So it's like crazy to think, but like we're also running a business here, right? We're not just detailers. We're business owners that that runs a detailing business, right? Um, so it's like if, if you want to go and have fun, right? Like look at um, uh, Chicago Auto Pros, right? With their $10,000 detail. Uh, I saw that video quite a, quite a bit ago, but it's like when they do the undercarriage, they polish everything, they clean the interior, polish the interior. And it's like for the detailers that want to go all out and just want to clean and detail literally everything that they can, offer a $10,000 package, right? Where it's like, hey, yeah, we're going to keep it for a month. We're going to do literally everything. We're going to spend 200 hours on here. But yeah, have a customer pay for that. But don't offer a $10,000 service for $800, like you see how dumb that is, right? Um, and that's an extreme example, but it's like, how many of us are, are you know, end up doing a two-step correction because, oh, but the paint will look so shiny and they're paying for like a, a, a all-in-one, you know? Um, and it, don't get me wrong, it, it's hard to draw that line because you're like, oh man, like I like doing this and it'll look so good and, well, you know, what if I just do another two, three hours? It's like, if you wanna do more work, if you wanna do higher level work, the customer has to pay for that. Like we had a, a Toyota Tundra come in for water spot removal and uh, it was it was severe, it was everywhere and it was se severe across the entire vehicle, the glass, the trim, the, the chrome, the, the paint, the wheels. And I think we initially quoted $5,000 to remove all of that, right? Because that was gonna include wet sanding, that was gonna include just doing as much as we can, right? Um, and the customer was like, yeah, okay, you know, no, thank you, that's too expensive. So he like, I think maybe two, three weeks, he went around and I don't know, just looked for quotes or something. And then um, he uh, he comes back to us and we're like, hey man, yeah, well, he, yeah, he contacts us again and, and he's like, hey, what if we take off the, the glass, the chrome, the wheels, the front bumper and some other stuff. And, and he was like, well, how much would that be? And we were like, uh, and, then, and then it gets like, oh, okay, well, now it's a little trickier, but it's like, yeah, okay, two thousand dollars for for the for the um for the paint removal, right? Minus the front bumper, minus the chrome, minus the wheels, uh, and minus the glass. And um and we got caught in that same situation. We're like, okay, well, man, to to really get like bet not not the best results, but to get better results, like oh, it would help if we wet sand this a little bit. And again, like we started correcting, and some panels were were just cleaning up with a with a correction. But then we we're like, oh, well, these are some of these, the water are pretty severe. Like it would help if we wet sand like a little bit, right? But we don't have the full budget to do everything. So it's like, well, what if I kind of like half-ass the wet sand and like 
kind of wet sand but just enough to take off the, the water spots but you know like not going all the way and then like you get caught up in that in that weird it's such a uh, weird situation of like well oh if we just do a little more like it'll come a lot better but they're not paying for that level of work and and and, and again like that's a situation you get in right so if you want to do the work find the customers that are willing to pay for that level of work so that's going to um, conclude this list of the four things you need to do in 2024 to grow your business. Again, these are fundamentals. These are applicable. You know, 10 years from now, you can reference this, this, this podcast and the same things are going to apply. So that's going to end it for me right there. Let me know if you have any topics that you want me to cover by sending me a DM on Instagram. I'm at Dita Groove on Instagram. Uh, but other than that, I will talk to you on the next one.